So um, I thanks very much to Duncan, who's obviously the expert on this topic of the ref. Um, I realised that uh, from the initial poll that quite a lot of people attending this are really too young to have experienced the ref. Uh, and some of you are maybe from overseas where this doesn't actually apply. Um, but I'll try and explain what's relevant from my perspective. Um, ah, my slides are not advancing. Oh, there they are. Yeah, okay. Um, so the idea of the REF originally was, it was dated back in the, I mean, I predate the REF, which makes me very, very old, but um, before the REF and the RE and everything else, the basic idea was to have a coherent uh, system for allocating funding, research funding to universities. And it's uh, argued that the system that we've currently got with the REF uh, has led to better research. Uh, and so in a report on the REF, it was pointed out that on average, we now have 22% of outputs judged world leading, four star up from 14% in 2008, and then 50% judged internationally excellent up from 37%. But can we really sort of trust those sorts of figures? Um, because many of us who are attending this meeting would say that um, the replication crisis is, is really evidence that there's a quite a lot wrong with particularly scientific research, uh, and that we may be, you know, how, how much confidence can we place in these ratings? And I just want to check again, are my slides advancing? Because I've had bad experiences in the past. Uh, so far, yes. Good. Okay. No, I think once they've started, they'll keep going. We've still got the dog on the screen. Oh, uh, good. That's great. So this is what happened at the last REF 2014, uh, and this is part of the, their, their reporting on it. Uh, but what I'd like to draw your attention to is that, that it was a huge exercise, um, and, and as Duncan pointed out, some people have complained about the burden of this. But what it boils down to is that you had 191,000 research outputs, mostly in the sciences, these are journal articles, in the humanities they can be entire books, and you had them evaluated by 898 academic members in panels plus some research users. This means that each person was evaluating 213 items, probably twice that number, because certainly in the psychology panel, uh, there was double marking, I know, I know from people who were on the panel. So this, and this was done in a fairly short period of time. And the people who were doing it were not necessarily expert on the topics of the papers and books and things that they were evaluating. So this is called peer review. But it's been questioned whether it can really be counted as peer review because it has to be a fairly quick and dirty and um, superficial evaluation. And I mean no dishonor to the people who are on these panels who work, I know, very hard and rigorously, but you just can't uh, do this amount of reviewing of material outside your subject area and call it peer review. And this point has been made by others. So I would argue that there's actually been a negative impact on research culture because this so-called peer review um, is quick and dirty and it will encourage superficial judgments based on proxy indicators. And I should say that I do not blame Research England or their predecessors and Hefke and people for this because the reason we've got to this place is that academics themselves have never been satisfied with anything less than having every paper read by somebody. But this is where it's got us to. It's got this, us to this incredibly complicated um, detailed system which I think is, is counterproductive. Um, the other thing that people will look at is things like grant income and whether your publications are high impact. Again, this is not encouraged actually by the people who develop the REF, although it's often blamed on them. Um, but it's really that we have to rate people on something and that this has led to hiring and firing decisions in institutions um, being based very much on whether, for example, an individual researcher can bring in a lot of grant income and can have so-called high impact publications. And the, there's the horrible term as to whether you are referable when, you're appoint, you, when you apply for a job. Um, so I regard these as, as really negative impacts on our research culture, which have led us to some extent to go for this sort of quick and dirty approach to doing things rather than proper slow science in the case of the sciences. So could the REF actually be repurposed to make it more, more sort of suitable for actually producing excellence rather than this rather superficial evaluation? I would say we need to retain what is good. And as Duncan has pointed out, um, accountability is a big point of, uh, part of it. We can't just sit back and expect the government to give us money. Uh, we need to sort of show what we're doing with it. We need, I think, to have a transparent system. And indeed, the UK is world renowned for the transparency of the REF, which is much admired in countries where everything's decided by old boy networks, for example. 
uh, we want to have a degree of fairness. And so I think those things are things to hang on to. But what is bad, and this, this also relates to some extent to what the Stern report came up with, uh, bureaucracy and expense of the exercise. And it's now not just a case of doing the ref, you have to do a mock ref a year before you do the actual ref. And everybody has to evaluate papers and ad infinitum within their department before they even get sent out to the ref. Um, I would say there's a rather superficial evaluation with a focus on individual so-called excellence. And this instills this sense that we're all terribly competitive and it is really anti-collaboration. Um, so my personal recommendations, which I'm happy to discuss, is that what we've got to ditch for a start are league tables, which uh, the whole idea of the ref and, you know, where do you stand in the ref league table is somehow assuming that you are, we're all evaluated on a single scale when in fact what we actually want are diverse institutions we want some institutions that are good at the traditional academic subjects but we also want places that are good at technology we want places that are good at working with their local communities and so on so we should stop thinking of research excellence as a unitary dimension which is what is it seems to be encouraged by these league tables which again as, as duncan said these are not actually published by the people who develop the ref but they're seized upon by institutions who want to score points but I, should also, I would also say, and this again is really very much directed at academics themselves, we, we should give up on the idea that we're ever going to get a perfect comprehensive evaluation system that really reflects some sort of truth about who is excellent and who is not. Um, this has led us to get more and more complicated in how we evaluate things. And it, it would be better to say we should be satisfied with something that does the job um, and has a reasonable cost benefit ratio, not something that costs us a huge amount to learn relatively little. The point has been made that if the ref came up with any solution other than the idea that Oxford, Cambridge and London get most of the money, we would decide it wasn't a very good ref and we'd change the rules. In fact, that happened in the 2014 system that they changed how they weighted the different star rankings. So we, I would say we need to radically rethink and simplify the ref. I would get rid of the quality evaluation bit altogether. I think it wastes time and generates bad incentives um, and return to focusing at the level of the institution, which as Duncan said, is what it's intended to do. Um, and you could quite easily allocate block funding on the basis of um, how many active researchers you had in an institution, or you might decide that that's not the criterion and that you might want to encourage institutions that don't have a lot of research by giving them funding so they could develop. That's a very radical idea. And then I was very interested to see last month that um, from the point of view of people at this meeting, um, it's particularly interesting to see that there's now been ideas put forward for how to assess researchers in a way that encourages reproducible, creditable research. Um, and these principles, which are described only a couple of months ago in PLOS Biology, um, have been dis um, got together by a very large group of people interested in this area with very concrete suggestions about the sorts of things that you could start evaluating, not so much at the individual researcher level, although that you can use some of these in that way, but many of these are principles that you could apply at the institutional level. How far um, does, for example, um, the institution show commitment to open reproducible research? Does it uh, encourage people to pre-register their protocols? Does it encourage them to publish all their pre-registered studies? Does it use open data, open materials, open code, open access publication? And I think if we move to reward institutions who can evidence that these practices are encouraged both in training and in policies for hiring and firing, uh, we'd be moving towards a system that actually moved research in the right direction uh, rather than encouraging people to sort of be rather glitzy about it and try and get their four star publications, which are often, you know, hyped up research rather than necessarily credit credible research. I would also emphasis that, uh, emphasize that team working is often in these days the way forward, whereas we have a system that still has the idea that you have a sort of lone genius who produces wonderful research and most institutions are desperate to try and find a genius who will then head up some sort of group, but they don't often reward the people who are essential to that group functioning properly. And I would also argue it would be great if REF could actively discourage what I call grant hoarding and hyper-prolific publication, that the, the few people who tend to have more grants than they know what to do with and waste a lot of funds accordingly and who just spin out too many publications rather than waiting and pr producing a, a good meaty report on a piece of work. 
I should say, though, that there are risks that we have to bear in mind if we are going to change anything in the system. I love this book by John Kay, which is called Obliquity, which is not actually about academics, but it's about all sorts of things, uh, general principles for how you run organisations. And a lot of what he talks about is in businesses, but he points out that you really need to distinguish between um, different levels uh, of evaluation of something. Uh, you can say to a stonemason working on a medical, med medieval cathedral, what are you doing? And he may say, I'm cutting this stone to shape, which is really basic concrete stuff, or I'm building a cathedral, which is where he's going with it. Um, but I'm working for the glory of God is the really high level objective. So you've got these three different levels that you can work at. And the point that uh, John Kay makes is that the worst thing you can do is to proceed by defining objectives, analyze them into goals, break them down into actions, and then start just evaluating everybody in terms of how many of those actions are they carrying out. If you did that with a cathedral, you'd sort of just be rewarding people for cutting up bits of stone. Um, I and mean, there's a bit of a sense of that's what we're doing with the ref. We, we sort of drilled down to this basic level with losing sight of the bigger picture of what we're trying to achieve. Um, and so the warning from history, I think, is that we have to be very careful if we change things not to make the solution worse than the problem. Academia is very diverse. Uh, the people in the humanities get very upset by some of the recommendations that scientists try to impose because they just don't fit necessarily to a humanities framework. So there's a real danger if you start introducing new ideas that you're shoehorning everyone into the same structures. And there's a huge risk of increasing bureaucracy because everybody thinks, you know, that's what transparency is about, being able to document every actual single little thing. And that's got us to the situation we are at the moment with the REF. I use Athena Swan as, as an example of, of how things can go wrong because I think it has gone rather wrong. It was a scheme with the highest intentions to improve conditions for women in academic science, but it suffered from a sort of mission creep and it's become a huge bureaucratic exercise which takes up a lot of time for academics and administrators. And uh, ironically, the burden tends to fall disproportionately on women. And so I think we do have to be very, very careful that when we're thinking of revamping any sort of system, that we don't end up by making matters worse. And we should think very, very hard, particularly about in anything that changes, that in introduces more bureaucracy and a need for more administrators. Um, but I'll stop at that point because I'm very interested to have discussion with the rest of you. Um, and I am notorious for critiquing not just the ref, but also the TEF. I'm sorry, Duncan, but if anybody who wants to um, look at what I have to say on those things, um, I have a long talk which covers both of them on this uh, slide share site. But I think otherwise that's me done for this talk. Thanks. <laughs>